All right. So we have Jim Gleason with us uh, today. Jim, it's really nice to see you and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I just want to start off first by saying congratulations to you on being one of our 2021 Bounce Back Give Back Award winners. Um, Thank you. I'm I very honored. <laughs> I think I can speak on behalf of everyone at the Chris Klug Foundation when I say, you know, we're all so happy to, ha uh, to have you and for you and proud to recognize the fantastic work that you're doing uh, to give back to the transplant community since your own heart transplant in 1994. 28 years it's it's amazing to me and often people say wow 28 years I said you ought to be inside looking out it's even more amazing <laughs> I bet I bet and I was going to say like a heart transplant in 1994 so to my understanding that's pretty early in terms of you know when the procedure became more common I believe heart transplants started becoming more commonplace in about 1980 is that correct right I I was benefited by it had matured as a process by the time I needed it. So I'm certainly not one of the pioneers. I'm <laughs> certainly enjoying the benefits of long life with a heart transplant. And I, I thank God every day. And I think of my donor every day. And so it's great to really be able to give back in gratitude for an anonymous gift. Uh, I did learn about my donor family, uh, but it's just amazing every day. I'm sure. Yeah. Every day is a gift. Um, and, and so just to, you know, prior to your heart transplant, how did you initially discover that you needed a heart transplant? You know, what was your initial reaction, your family's reaction? You, what was sort of going through your head through uh, finding out this news? Actually, I was waking up in the middle of the night anxious, no pain, no shortness of breath or anything. And eventually I just went to my family doctor, a Dr. Mark Real a real doctor of all things. And uh, he was a wise man. And he asked me if I had anything happen recently. I said, no, he's maybe you've had a cold or a flu or something. Oh, yeah, I had a, a cold, but it went away, you know, after a week or two. And she's like, he says, I need to send you over to the hospital, have your heart checked out. Well, when a real doctor tells you to do something, you do it. And next thing I know, they came back and said, Mr. Gleason, your heart has been attacked by a virus. And so the pressures are such that uh, we need to push on some medications. And if they work, that's fine. If they uh, don't, we're going to have to consider a heart transplant. A heart transplant. I mean, this would be in 1992. And so there wasn't a whole lot of information about organ donation and transplant. I mean, it's not like it was a regular topic on Oprah or anything like that. And so I said, <laughs> hey, I opt for the medication. I'm going to be better. Thank you. Let me get out of here. And two years later, the heart continued to fail. And as I was working in corporate America, I found myself exhausted. And just going across the parking lot with a bag, I'd have to stop, catch my breath, and then continue. And so at some point in time, I was trying to do some paperwork in my office, and I just couldn't focus on it. And finally, I sat back and said, what, what's this like? What's going on? And it was like, I could see what was in front of me, but it just wasn't registering. And I thought, wow. It feels like, like you're drowning. And, and so I called my cardiologist and I described the symptoms to her. And she said, Mr. Gleason, you need to come over here right now. You know, what you're describing is exactly what we put in our textbooks for students to learn about a failing heart. And when she did some more tests, the ejection fraction was down into the mid teens. And I had no idea what normal was. Uh, normal is about 55 or so. And so I ended up down at the Hospital University of Pennsylvania with a great team uh, that was educating me on the whole concept. And I have to admit, I was never nervous. I was never scared. I had actually been in a couple of situations where I faced death, had no choice. And so in a way that had prepared me for this. And I had figured out long ago that the one guarantee you have once you're born is that you're going to die someday. And I was about 50 years old. And at that point in time, I, I said, you know, I've done the best I could with this life. If, if I had to pass today, I have no regrets. And so it wasn't a shoe in that I wanted to do this. By the time they got through, they said, Mr. Gleason, you've got about two years to live. Well, I had young children growing up. I had a lot of things to look forward to. And so when it came to a decision as to whether to opt for an organ transplant or not, I, I was concerned that it was going to cost a million dollars and I'd leave my family in debt. 
but with uh, insurance and so forth, it wasn't that bad. And I said, yes. And I can still remember, it must have been the social worker doing some evaluation as I laid in the bed. And she said, Mr. Gleason, this is not a black and white decision. We don't know what your quality of life is going to be after a transplant. Well, <laughs> I'm a sort of an optimist and I believe that, hey, it is black and white. Do I want to live or do I want to die? I said, I want to live. And so I ended up in the hospital. And in those days, it's not like there was a whole lot of people listed. And so three of us there at Penn Medicine uh, were listed for transplant and were in the hospital. In those days, you stayed in the hospital. Uh, you were waiting for death, either your own or for somebody else to die in just the right way and for you to be at the top of the list and for that offer of an organ to match your needs. And so five weeks later, I had that opportunity and I can still remember Heather, my transplant coordinator nurse uh, on the phone. I was in my pajamas on the, on the floor down at the nurse's station and they had a phone for me and I picked it up and she's Mr. Gleason, I think we have a heart for you. And I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget that voice. And I looked up and I said, thank you. And I said to her, thank you. And I called my family and said, you better get down here. Something's gonna start happening soon. And so that afternoon I ended up going into surgery. And again, no fears. I had the best team there. And Mike Acker was my surgeon and he is still 28 years later, a personal friend. I run into him all the time down there. I volunteer at the hospital among other things. And so we've had just an amazing time. In fact, I was at a conference out in Denver, uh, a, a AST conference, and he was giving a presentation. I said, oh, I got to go sit in on his presentation. And I did. And as I sat there among all these doctors, I said, oh, I have to say something. And so at the end, when they're open for questions, I got up and I said, Mike, I just have to tell you, thank you. It's, I think at the time it was like 25 years. I said, you made it possible. And I just want to thank you in front of all your peers. And I think they gave him a standing ovation. Yeah. And so how special is that? be able to reach out in front of his peers and to tell him the gratitude for the fine work he has done and is still doing. And so I often run into him. I have opportunities to talk to uh, nursing classes there. And uh, every once in a while he walks in or I walk into him as we go past the ICU or something like that. And so it's been a great relationship. In fact, the funny part is I've served on the UNOS uh, board for two, three year terms. And sometimes some of those issues are pretty complex. And while I think I know what I'm doing, it, it, I heard him speak against something that I thought sounded good to me. And I said, Mike, I said, could you explain to me what it is that you see from your perspective? He said, well, why don't you come up my office and we'll sit and talk. And we have this great conversation for an hour. And I have to be honest, by the time I left his office, I'm not sure if I've understood any more than what they went in. But I mean, here's a surgeon a heart transplant surgeon giving me a layman the time of day to spend an hour like that. And so there's been great medical professionals that have made all this possible and I can't say thank you enough to them. The other thing that I've come to realize, and I don't know if this is more so with heart patients than organ, other organ types, just and it, maybe it's my network, we're all hearts, right? Uh, but it seems like the hearts are more active in terms of giving back. I mean, if somebody gave you the gift of life, right? we're coming up on Christmas, right? I mean, if somebody gave you this amazing gift, but you didn't know who it was, how frustrating that would be not to be able to say, thank you. And so since it is an anonymous process, and I figured out about 10% of patients eventually may connect with their donor families and know somebody that they can express it to. We, we find ways to say thank you with action. And so I got involved with TRIO, Transplant Recipients International Organization, about a year after I got my transplant, so back in 95. And we formed a local TRIO Philadelphia chapter. And since then, I've been very active both in that chapter and then at the national level. I've been the president now for about 12 years. And it's just been amazing to be able to give back of the skills that I had in corporate America and my own personal skills by way of giving back to help others follow in this path. And so I truly am blessed. And I've been blessed also with 
a second marriage and I married Pam, a donor family, a donor mother who lost her son, Christopher, at the age of 13. He was killed on a bike by a speeding motorist on a cell phone. And uh, we became really good friends and eventually got married. So we actually share both sides of that story. We live the donor and the recipient side every day. And that is so unique. And it's, uh, I've come to realize a lot of patients never get to uh, connect with the donor side, either through organizations or activities. And so it's been a, a real special blessing. And we count every day. Uh, my mantra when I get up in the morning is, wow, a boat ground another day. This is going to be a great one. <laughs> and so uh, it, it, one other thing I just want to mention, back in, and I don't remember what year it would be, I'm going to say maybe 96, maybe 98, the, at the U.S. Transplant Games, Trio had a booth. And I was hosting the booth. And we had Chris Kluge's book that we were giving out for, pe who, for people who signed up as new members. The next row behind us was Chris Kluge. Oh. <laughs> Some corporate sponsor had him signing pictures. And I said, oh, wait a minute. So we took a bunch of the books, went back and said, hey, Chris. <laughs> he, he signed the books for us. And I just recently, when we got connected with this whole foundation, I went back and looked. Now, I have a photograph of yeah. standing next to Chris back in those days. He looked younger. I looked younger. <laughs> but we have a connection that goes back almost a quarter of a century with Chris and his great work. And I can't say it enough how honored I am uh, to be selected to represent and to share the inspiration because many a doctor I, we run into and when I share that I'm out 28 years, I get this look that says, no, that's not possible. It doesn't last that long. <laughs> what a silly thing for them to say. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I've had two knee replacements now and just had the second hip replacement a month ago. I'm young again. <laughs> and so even as I, I'm fast approaching 80 years old, I feel like I'm 50. And so, yeah, I've bounced back as many patients do. And I just uh, hope that by sharing this here, it's an inspiration for others who are facing it as candidates or have had a transplant and wonder how many years the average for heart transplant recipients, and I don't think it's changed since then, is nine years. Well, when you're out 28 years, you've beaten the average, that's for sure. And so I am still inspired by people who are out more than 30 years. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, without bragging, I share 28 years of life. Uh, my children have grown up. I now have grandchildren. I have seven grandchildren that I didn't even have then. I've been able to attend my children's weddings. It's just been such an amazing life that I enjoy every day. So how much further does this go? <laughs> My wife says, you better start thinking about 90. 90? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think you can do it. <laughs> I, uh, hey, I'm going for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, gosh, I, I mean, I cried, I laughed, I went through a whole circle of emotions with that story. So, Jim, wow, what an incredible life you've led and are Amen. living and your uh, philosophy around giving back and the act of charity, especially within the transplant community, I think, sort of really embodies why we established this Bounce Back Give Back Award and why we do what we do um, with the Chris Klug Foundation. Um, and speaking of awards, I mean, just going through your bio here, you were, you have accolades all over the place. So just to just to sort of talk more about, you know, you are recognized as the soap or you were recognized with the Soapbox Award by the Gift of Life Donor Program, which is in uh, Philadelphia, I believe. Is that correct? Right. Yep. Yeah. And then UNOS, uh, United Network for Organ Sharing, named you the winner in 2019 of the National Donor Memorial Award for Excellence um, in recognition of um, your efforts as a, a donation advocate. Um, and, you know, you're a professional speaker. So CBS broadcast a special uh, Valentine's Day story featuring uh, your unique background with your wife and, you know, how your relationship blossomed. Um, and, you know, 
it's been 27 years, is that correct, with your new heart? Um, and you participate in the transplant games every year. Um, you're active within, um, you know, you're with the uh, American Society of Transplantation. Um, gosh, uh, self-published heart transplant newsletter. I'm just pulling these all out. But if you could talk just a little bit more about, you know, you're sort of all over the place. President of TRIO, another great example. When did you sort of decide coming out of your transplant, okay, I've given this, you know, I, I'm sure you've realized I have this new lease on life. How am I going to use it? Uh, what made you sort of veer towards organ donation and promoting that cause? It was very natural. I, I've been very blessed uh, with a background that provides me with some skills in public speaking. I started out as a teacher and then I was supporting from the technical side, uh, the computer industry in my career, 40 year career with Unisys. And so it's very natural to just use those skills. Again, as I said in the beginning, when I didn't know who the donor was, how do you say thank you? And the only thing I could do was turn around and give the experience of a successful transplant to the community by way of saying, please, when you no longer need your organs, don't bury them in the ground. I mean, uh, there's a story that is told uh, about a father and his two daughters were facing the decision of his spouse, their mother uh, had brain dead and were being asked about organ donation. And she hadn't indicated her wishes, but the husband couldn't face it. And the girls said, but dad, mom would have wanted this. And the con argument continued even down the cafeteria. An orderly came by and said, excuse me, sir, I couldn't overhear your conversation. Can I say something to you? And the father learned, like, what? It's not a question of whether your heart, your wife is going to be an organ donor or not. She will be an organ donor. The question is whether you're going to donate to the ground or to save somebody's life. And so with that, the father turned to the two girls and said, you know, we need to go back upstairs. We have some papers to sign. And that's really the question that I love. I do many presentations. In fact, I have a spreadsheet where I've listed over 500 presentations I've given over these many years, many with my wife talking about the organ donor side of things. And we interweave our two stories uh, so that the whole thing ties together. And that's a closing piece of that presentation to make people realize, yeah, you're gonna to donate to the ground or to save somebody's life? And the answer is very simple. And so it was just a natural thing for me to do, to be, yeah, proud of the success of transplantation that gave me this new extension to life. It doesn't cure death. It doesn't avoid death. You're going to die someday anyway and accepting that. And so it's what do you do with it today? And that's the daily challenge that UCC have and I have and everybody has. And so this type of experience really puts it more in perspective because you no longer take life for granted. And so in thanks to Roberto Cuevas, who is my organ donor over in Brooklyn, New York, he was attacked, he was celebrating his 38th birthday and he was attacked on the street, beaten about the head with a baseball bat. He ended up in a coma. Now we know coma is not death, but nine days later, his brain stopped. And so his brothers and sisters got to face the decision, there weren't registries in those days, of being an organ donor. And they said yes. And Roberto's heart ended up over in Philadelphia for a dying father. And I often ask an audience today, I said, you know, where is Roberto's heart today? Nobody ever answers. I said, yeah, it's right here, right? It's beating in front of you. I said, now, Roberto was dead. Was his heart dead? And most of these are medical audiences, either uh, medical students or nursing. And nobody has an answer to that either. And I said, well, if this heart were dead, I wouldn't be here sharing Roberto's story, would I? And so it's a very emotional story. It's a very important story. And it really does raise the question for people to make a decision. And I say, you know, I'm not telling you what to do, but if you think about it, wouldn't you like, as Roberto did, still have his heart beating 28 years later? I, that is just such an amazing miracle. And so every day I say my prayer of thanks and I say, thank you, Roberto. 
Well, you got me again, Jim. I'm tearing <laughs> up over here. <laughs> I I'm mean, sorry. but you're you're so right. And to have that legacy of you know sharing a heart is just. I'm going to get choked up again, but it's very touching. And um, I, I love the way you put the, you know, in the ground or in someone else. So that, doesn't um, that make it clear? It really does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, ta talking about, you know, what we do every day and our actions every day. Um, you know, I, I have not received a transplant. I'm not related to anybody who has or a donor family at all. But, um, you know, I joined this foundation kind of not knowing anything about organ donation. I had already registered as an organ donor, you know, and uh, I started learning more about it as, you know, the job required. And I, it, like you said, it's just right there, plain and simple. It's like, how can you not how can you not agree uh, with this? So, and it seems like, you know, you have, you have the ability to teach and to um, talk about, uh, you know, you with your experiences and mine using my platform um, and us both using our platform. So I think, um, you know, what you're doing is incredible. And uh, this award, the Bounce Back Give Back Award that the Chris Klug Foundation gives out every single year. <laughs> Uh, to two transplant recipients, I think um, you embody every aspect of it. And we couldn't have picked a better uh, winner for this year. And we're so thankful that you joined us today. So um, thank you again from all of us at CKF um, for joining us for, you know, our Summit for Life. Wish I wish you could be here in person uh, oh, with us I. celebrating, but, um, you know, that's just the way it is right now. And we've certainly modified parts of our event to, um, to ensure everyone's safety, especially as a healthcare nonprofit. But um, um, my, wife so Pam, my wife, Pam, and I were so looking forward to it. She went out and bought some clothes. In fact, she's got this jacket that is so light and so warm. It's working out well for our winter here in New Jersey right now. But uh, she was looking forward to this, too. And so maybe we get out there with you next year if the offer's still there. But uh, of we course. Will of course, yes, of course, the offer is still stands and we will see you out here, God willing, next year, uh, if everything goes the way the way we hope uh, in the following year. But again, Jim, thank you so much for joining us today and for representing the ideal transplant recipient, giving back, supporting uh, others like you who have gone through the transplant experience, supporting donor families and those within that community. Um, I know yours and your wife's story are, uh, you know, extremely valuable for uh, and touching for a lot of those people to hear. So we thank you again so much for joining us today. And we, we are honored to have you here with us and congratulations uh, I, again. I wanna say thank you for offering the platform of being able to show the world that transplantation works and there's every reason to say yes to organ donation when you don't need those organs yourself anymore. So Cece, really appreciate this opportunity and look forward to being out there in person with you next year, God willing, as you said. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jim. <laughs>